St. Maximus the Confessor was a monk uh, born probably around 580 AD, lived to 662. He occupied no official position or office in the church. He was a lay monk, um, but he was, by the end of his life, he was, and earlier, he was so well respected uh, about his opinions on whether it's interpreting the church fathers, interpreting scripture, that he was sought after by all kinds of different people, abbots, various monasteries, sometimes politicians, sometimes former, um, you know, novices or whatever about his opinions about various controversies or uh, or just topics. And so, um, even though he didn't have that official position, he um, he was he was the center of a lot of Christological controversy, especially whether debating. Uh, the the two or one nature of positions in Christology, or the two or one activities, and then finally the two or one wills in Christ. Um, and he's called a confessor because he was, in fact, tortured at the age of 80. Um, his tongue was cut out, his right hand was cut off, so he could no longer write with his hand or speak with his mouth, his vile doctrines. <laughs> so, um, I think generally, like intellectually, he's in he's in what you might call the, the Alexandrian Christian tradition. Um, and so he, he, you know, lots of people agree that he has direct familiarity, not only with some well-known figures that he names comments on, like St. Gregory the, uh, of Nazianzus uh, and St. Dionysius, well, for him, St. Dionysius the Areopagite or some scholars called Pseudo Dionysius and, uh, and you know, St. Basil and all that. But but there's also, um, you know, pretty good evidence that he knew origins writings or important parts of origins writings. Certainly St. Gregory of Nyssa and Novagrius Ponticus, the, uh, the monk who is in that tradition as well. And so those aren't his only influences, but just generally he's in that stream. That's how he interprets scripture, for example. He'll often go to allegory and consider many different interpretations. Was St. Maximus a universalist? I think to my mind, there are about three passages that are more as if you will infernalist sounding these are these are like for example one of them he's commenting on jude 6 the the everlasting chains uh, shackling the fallen angels mentioned there which is an allusion to first enoch um and he at one point interprets those chains as the fixity the immobility of the free will so that they will never enjoy divine rest okay so that sounds like a sort of uh, infernalist traditional picture of at least the fallen angels in that case and another text maybe wicked human beings will never go there but there's also i mean i would say eight to ten at least passages that uh where maximus whether sometimes a little bit more broadly like he's casting a massive vision about the return of humanity and the human nature to god through christ um but you know but his emphasis is always on the full accomplishment of that project that before all ages that christ himself is the beginning the middle and the end of all ages and he even says in one famous text um that in him all the ages and all the creatures within those ages in christ were created right have their beginning and end and so they never come to rest until they rest in 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 god in their true rest right and so he's he's clearly aware, there's another text, he's clearly aware of St. Gregory of Nyssa's idea, a few different texts, that evil by its nature is limited and so will run out. Um, that the sort of the wicked soul, even if it takes aeons and it sort of is, is looking everywhere, all, every time it imagines for itself rest, a final purpose, a final destination, insofar as that that's wicked, that's actually a false and self-deceptive picture. And so what that soul will find is disappointment. But the very fact that it finds disappointment means that it will continue to move and continue to look elsewhere. And so there are some texts as well that where Maximus seems to be aware of that and entertains that uh, Gregory's position as his own, that that eventually will come to an end. So anyway, you you got that division of text. I do think the if you're talking quantity, the 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 weight goes towards the universalist picture. Now I think there's two things to note about Maximus and apocatastasis or universal salvation, like that I think are there's actually three things to note that are not often noted. Number one, um, 
you, we do have to be cognizant or mindful of the situation Maximus was in being on the far side of Constantinople too, whose canons, you know, depending on how you read all that scholarship in the debate, may or may not condemn origin, maybe by name, maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe the canons, you know, uh, are targeting some sort of later originist system. Maybe they weren't even a part of the original council and so forth. Um, but, but the very least, it, it, even if even if you say that the the originist canons were not a part of the original council, it's clear. For example, one of the earliest texts that Maximus has called "Questions and Doubts." He's ex explicitly asked about uh, apocatastasis and um, and Gregory of Nyssa's use of it. You could go earlier, a century or so before that, and the correspondence of Barsanuvius and John in Palestine, another novice brings to them, writes to them a letter, question, uh, questions about apocatastasis and Gregory of Nyssa. And hey, it looks like St. Gregory actually supports this idea of apocatastasis. How could that be? So that in that tradition, again, and especially once again, if Maximus is from Palestine um, and is in that sort of network, the idea of uh, certain monks or novices coming upon writings of St. Gregory of Nyssa or Origen or whoever, and finding these texts that are pretty explicitly universalist and then wondering about, hold on, how, how can it be, uh, isn't, isn't at all, it's not, un, it's not surprising that that would be raised, but it's also not surprising that there would be hesitance around, um, around Maximus's answer to the question. And, um, and in fact, I think one of the major scholars of Maximus from the last century, also himself a major theologian, the uh, Swiss Catholic theologian Hans Ruth von Balthasar, he, his position was that Maximus was himself a confident universalist, but, uh, but did adhere to, to a certain tradition which thought that that was a doctrine or a belief best reserved for those more mature in their faith, more mature in their spiritual progress so that they wouldn't misunderstand it and it wouldn't become you know, justification for moral or spiritual laxity. And so Maximus might, so there's two things here that what I've just said, number one, it could, it may have been somewhat, uh, somewhat of a um, risky business to get involved in openly and really clearly declaring universalism uh, after 553, maybe, maybe not. The other thing though, is that there is the spiritual, there's this the spiritual tradition, which would want to be cautious about just opening up uh, uh, such a doctrine for, for everyone, you know, and, and whether or not that's still valid is a different question, but I'm just saying for Maximus in his historical context, that could be there. Balthazar, uh, a hopeful universalist, but also a scholar wrote a great book on Maximus, argued that that was actually his position. And that um, you can tell that a few times, there's like three main passages where, where uh, Maximus says something like, we could we could give a more lofty interpretation to these words, but uh, but we should pass over this with honorable silence, lest it should cause somebody to stumble, whatever or whatever. So so you see Maximus being aware of that spiritual tradition, which wouldn't wouldn't be cautious with such a doctrine. So that's one thing is the context of Maximus and his whether or not he's going to be explicit about it about his own beliefs on this matter. But the, I do think there's two parts of his, uh, of his thought that deserve more to be noted and often are not in these discussions about whether or not he's universalist in what sense. The first thing is that, Matt, and I won't get into all the reasons why, but Maximus does adhere to something close to Gregory of Nyssa's view of nature, human nature, which is that human nature isn't isn't some kind of reality beyond the, the world of space-time that is already there and we all sort of participate in it just a little bit. But the whole of human nature really is the collective of all the members of human nature. In other words, the entirety of human beings, every human being together, makes up, constitutes human nature as a whole. And there are innumerable passages of Maximus where he talks about Christ, for example, one, one well-known one, descending into Hades, liberating and freeing. Uh, he, he actually calls it the land of darkness and eternal uh, shackles, eternal uh, bars, uh, bonds, which Christ, when he goes down as the light, he disperses the darkness of ignorance and Hades, he's talking about Hades. And he break as the power of God, he breaks the eternal bars and so frees all of, liberates all of human nature 
from its uh, from its enslavement to the cruel devil, right? So, so that. But my point is that if Maximus, as he seems to be very consistent in many many other places, if he actually thinks that human nature isn't really fully human nature apart from the collective totality of all human beings, then it wouldn't really make sense to say all of human nature has been liber liberated except some human beings who never were because they're a part of human nature, right? They're just as much a part of it to make it whole as, as, uh, as anybody else, right? And so unless, unless you have the, all of the individuals, you don't have the nature itself completely. Um, so that's one point, it's sort of a metaphysical point and it comes from his Christology, but that's a, that's a whole nother uh, side of things. And I, and I think it's relevant, but the other thing really that I think is even more move, like kind of moving even and, um, and, uh, and profound spiritually is that Maximus also has a view of sin and of evil as just to put it in my quick phrase, I've written about this a little bit as something like false incarnation. So he thinks sin isn't just breaking a law of God, nor is it just um, privation, like evil is just the privation of the good, which is a common. He, do, he does think it is privation in a certain way, but he actually thinks really what it is is, is, a, is, a, is the attempt to bring a delusion or a fantasy generated by the mind. To, to, to combine it with what he calls at one point, he's doing an allegorical interpretation of the golden calf from, from Exodus. And he says to combine it with the molten gold, the melted down gold of the passions, and you impress upon it a fantasy of your intellect, some delusion, like I'm so great, I deserve to be respected, I deserve to dominate, I deserve this or that sort of gratification of lust, whatever it is, whatever the, del the delusion you're entertaining in your mind, and you, you impress that image upon the passions of your own soul, and you try to, with your own person, with your own life, bring it into being. So that's like an attempt to incarnate something which God never wanted to create, which is to say, not a creation of God, not, a, not willed by God. And so I say all this because then if that's true, Maximus is very clear that divine judgment entails the destruction of what you and I through sin have illicitly brought into being. So it's not just a lack of doing the good, it's positively creating something which shouldn't have been made at all. So what do you do with that leftover, that sort of residue? You, you need to destroy it. And actually coming to see that you need to destroy this, what you've made of yourself, what you've made of your own soul, what you make of the world and the way you fantasize or interpret, interpret it. And coming to see that you need to destroy it and then going through the process of destroying it through ascesis, through prayer, through liturgy, through all the works of faith and, and the spiritual life. That is the judgment of God working through you so that salvation might be accomplished. So he has a great allegorical interpretation, for example, of Jonah, the book of Jonah. Uh, this is in question 64 of questions of Thalassius, if anyone's interested. And he says there, uh, you know, he notes at one part that uh, that God, you know, moves from conditional threats to Nineveh. You know, if unless they repent, I'll destroy them. There's a moment where he moves to an unconditional threat, like it's too late. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And of course, we know at the end of the story, it's not. To, to Jonah's great disappointment. <laughs> so the question arises, well, hold on a second. How can God say this city is going to be destroyed? And then it isn't. It's like, it's like what he says was going to come to pass never does. Well, Maximus's creative interpretation is actually it was, and its destruction and its salvation is the same. Because what it made of itself, it had to be destroyed, but it's being destroyed is the same thing. It's a it's the it's the it's, a, the, it's one dimension of its being recreated. In other words, being saved, truly created. So I think that's really relevant. And I've never, I hardly ever see that. I don't think I've ever seen that brought into the discussions about whether or not Maximus is a universalist, because it's important to, to know that when you run across a text in Maximus where he's talking about divine judgment and the total destruction of sin and evil and of the wicked and of the devil and what the devil is made of himself and so forth, you might be tempted to think, oh, well, if he thinks that that's going to be an eternal uh, eternal destruction, an absolute annihilation of evil and wicked beings, creatures, humans, or angels, uh, then I guess he's just an infernalist. 
Because that sounds like there's, you know, sounds like Revelation 20 or something. It's like lake of fire stuff. Throw the devil and his angels in there, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> the kind of subtle thing, and I, I can't say that Maximus ever explicitly spells this out, so I don't claim that. But what I will say is that there's nothing inconsistent with him saying, no, 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 the devil and his angels will be destroyed in forever, right? Chastened in that way or chastised rather in that way. Uh, but that doesn't, that's not inconsistent with their true salvation because in fact, you, as we should know from St. Paul, you only were saved because you're crucified with Christ and no longer live. You have to put off your old self in order to be made new in Christ. So there's an element of destruction, even in our own salvation right now, which is now just begun. And so if that's true of our salvation, why wouldn't it be true of anything salvation or any creature's salvation? Uh, so I think that element, that destruction and salvation can be two sides of the same coin, two dimensions or elements of the same process. That's, that's a kind of subtlety in Maximus's ascetic thought as a monk who is practicing this way of life that I don't think has been sufficiently taken account of uh, in this discussion. So, so in brief, in summary, do I think St. Maximus was a universalist? Yes, I think he was. Do I think he explicitly said that um, in a way that's like it couldn't be argued? No, I wouldn't go that far. Do I think his thought um, would make would sort of suffer from an incoherence if he wasn't a, an, an, a universalist? Yeah, I think it would. I think it would. And do I think there's more to take into account of to, to get a better, more nuanced picture of his view of these matters? Yeah, I, I do. So. So that's my, um, that's the best sort of briefest way I think I could try to answer that, you know, controversial question. <laughs>